You've said, I saw in an interview that the exorcist, I'm going to quote you, should not focus on the manifestations of evil, but focus on the power of God that is at work. That sounds great. How does that translate? Does that mean that when a demon is manifesting, you're kind of ignoring the antics and just going about the prayer? And is that, that's got to be really challenging in the moment to not like, (laughs) whoa, there's somebody in the air. Hmm. You know, I can't imagine that. But explain to people what that means a little bit about not focusing on what the devil is doing and staying really like laser focused on your role. A good analogy would be a parent with their child and the child is throwing a temper tantrum, but the parent doesn't feed into it. Mm-hmm. Let's the child do have the temper tantrum, but doesn't react. Because just as much as the child having the temper tantrum wants a reaction, the demon through these manifestations wants a reaction. So I've learned over the years, I just don't feed into it. Mm-hmm. So a good example I'll give, so we mentioned levitation earlier. So in one of the exorcisms in Rome, you know, 17 years ago when I was there, the, uh, the person began to levitate. And as I'm looking at this in, in disbelief, I was more impressed by Father Carmine. So as the person begins to levitate, he's looking out of the corner of his eye as he's praying. He never stops praying, but he reaches over and puts his hand on the head of the person and pushes them back down into the chair. So he never once paused mm-hmm. in the prayer of the church and I've, what I learned from that lesson was kind of the mentality, really, is that all you got? Because I'm not impressed. Right, right. So then you would have to walk into that room with the belief, you would have to actually walk through life with the belief that no demon or no presence of evil would be too powerful for God to handle. Absolutely, because you know the, the demons are still creatures. Mm. They're more powerful than humans, but they're still creatures. And no creature can be greater than the creator, God himself. Have you encountered people faking uh, possession and or trying to convince you they're possessed and something just doesn't look right? Is there a test that you administer? Like, do you use fake holy water and throw <laughs> it at them? And they're like, ah, and you're like, okay, this is not a real... Like, how, how, do you, how do you assess that other than just... You know, you talked about the psych evaluation and you talked about a medical examination, but how do you assess that if um, if it's a faker or not? So I do some of the things you you suggested. Sometimes I sprinkle people with water that's not been blessed, so it's not holy water. So I know whether or not it's been blessed. The demon will know because of the sacred character, but the person as an individual will not. So again, I do these things to get back to that moral certitude beyond a doubt this person truly is possessed. And I've had people that has tried to fake it, some deliberately, Mm -hmm. meaning they're trying to make a mockery of the church. Right. Some people do it indirectly just because they're dealing with maybe some mental health issues. I remember there was a, a, a priest back at my diocese, and I went to his parish, and he wanted me to evaluate somebody that the mother brought in about this young boy. And, and during our conversation, the boy started rolling all over the floor and whatnot. And then uh, the priest says to me, well, obviously this person is possessed. I'm like, no, that person is not possessed. Mm-hmm. And then I went back probably about a year later for another person. And then during the conversation, there was a little, not much. And he says to me, well, that person is not possessed. I said, no, that person is possessed. So some of that is just wisdom that comes with time. And even before I meet with somebody, I will spend time in prayer just asking God to guide and direct me in the best way to help this person and to know whether or not this is truly something demonic. I'm going to do one more question before we head to the chat, and then I have more after that. So Tyler, just if you can check that out. Um, Does possession always manifest in what we see in the movies? Or is it possible that possession could manifest in just evil? For example, you know, and I know I think Pat brought this up to you yesterday in your interview, asked a question related to, you know, why don't you see big athletes or big, you know, people well known that are undergoing possession? 
Is it possible, though, that possession could take a form of maybe your eyes don't go green, you don't levitate, but you behave in a way that is evil, um, unpleasant, damaging to others? Um, Could a random person who commits murder be possessed but not manifesting in a way that would make for a great movie? How do you feel about that broader definition of possession? I would say that manifestations indicate that there's an internal struggle taking place. So the person is dealing with the demonic, but they don't want it. They want to reject it. And that's what causes the manifestations. It could be that somebody is dealing with the demonic, but there is no internal struggle. Mm, And because of that, there would be no manifestations. The church would even say there's something that we would call perfect possession, where the individual has united their will with the will of the demon. I mean, obviously the goal in the spiritual life and the life of faith would be to unite our wills with the will of God. Mm -hmm. But there are people that would unite their wills with the will of the devil. And when that happens, there would be no internal struggle, so there would be no need for manifestations. If you like the short clip, you can catch another one here, or you can catch the full episode right here.